This is the third installment in our Summer at Coastline series. A couple of weeks ago, our founding pastor, Pastor John, got us started with a super encouraging reminder that even in the irrational and sometimes bewildering world we live in, we can still experience the peace of God by just fixing our minds on Him. And here's what I walked away with. Our minds are going to focus on something. That's just the way that they're made. And if we let them, they'll roam off into places that we really don't want to go. But by fixing our hearts, our emotions, and our thoughts on Jesus, we'll find the peace of God. Perfect peace, as Isaiah said, that surpasses all understanding. What an encouraging message. Then last week, Pastor Neil, our lead pastor, encouraged us to live a lifestyle of faith. He shared how our lifestyle is evidenced by the faith that we have. Faith is evidenced by the lifestyle that we lead. And using the Apostle Paul as our example, he encouraged us to live out our lives for the hope of heaven and our heavenly rewards. Not like a carrot that's dangled out in front of us that we can never quite grab hold of, but as the certain expectation of our future with Jesus. And this morning, well, it's Father's Day. So what's a dad to do? I mean, I didn't have to look very far for a message this morning. Actually, when Pastor Neil invited me to teach, I, I chose Father's Day for a couple of very important, uh, somewhat very personal reasons. First, I had a really good and godly father. He's in heaven today. And so I chose today to kind of say thank you to God for that incredible blessing of giving me a father that did things right. I realize not everyone gets that. My father, Herman Prestridge, grew up in a rural farming community in Mississippi. He was a combat veteran, a paratrooper, who was awarded a Purple Heart in his service to our great nation. Now, back in the 40s, that was a typical picture of an Army paratrooper before his first jump. And they took it before his first jump for a reason. <laughs> they may not make a second jump. You know, my, my father told me the only thing worse than being a paratrooper in the Army at that time was being a glider pilot. Now, this is early 40s. Can you imagine gliders in the early 40s? See why he was a paratrooper. When my dad returned stateside, he used a, a really extraordinary personality that he had to excel in retail sales. He found his niche fitting and selling men's suits and uniforms, and he did that literally for the rest of his life. Now, for me growing up, him being a suit salesman in a small town was really kind of cool because he knew everybody in town. But uniforms... That was a different thing. It meant that he knew every policeman and every deputy sheriff in the area. <laughs> I only had one run in with the law in my younger days, but my dad knew all about it before I got home that night. He was a deacon in the church I grew up in. He and my mother taught Sunday school together. And for as long as I can remember, my dad was at a specific door at First Baptist Church, greeting and handing out bulletins. He trained me well for that. My wife Anna remembers Mr. Prestridge before she remembers me, because every time she went into Brumfield's department store in downtown Pascagoula, Mississippi, he would be there with a big smile, an even bigger hug, and a piece of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum for her. Unless it was on Wednesday. Wednesday was his fishing day. And I may have caught some of that from him as well. <laughs> My dad was a good guy. So growing up, 
I just kind of assumed that everyone had a dad like mine, that all dads were inherently good. And it really wasn't until my adult years that I realized how fortunate, how blessed that I was. The second reason I chose Father's Day is I'm a father. And I thought it'd be a good idea to take a fresh look at fatherhood in kind of a new season of life for my wife and I. Our child is not a child anymore. He's an adult. Anna and I were a one-and-done couple. Our child, Ian, is a true Gulf Breeze native, and he grew up here at Coastline and went to Christian school for the most part. He's the uh, over-exuberant pirate down on the right there. He grew up around here surfing and sailing. He earned his black belt down the highway at Jimmy Falbo's karate studio. He played lacrosse and he graduated from Gulf Breeze High School. And just in case you think I'm trying to pass off Ian as this perfect little pastor's kid, uh, parenting was not without challenges. For example, he totaled every vehicle he ever owned. Except for the present one, thank God. And in his senior year, after a heated lacrosse rivalry, he was suspended from play from the Florida High School Athletic Association for hitting with intent to injure. I don't get that. He's the guy in the white uniform. Um, those were the... The charges were overturned, so to speak, after further review. The traffic accidents never were. <laughs> I'm proud to say Ian is a veteran of the United States Coast Guard. That made his dad proud, makes me smile. And he's now living my life in Tahoe City, California. He gets paid all winter to snowboard, and he gets paid all summer to run boats on Lake Tahoe. I call him Boy Wonder because I wonder how he gets to do the things that he does. Ian's 24 now, very independent and single. And instead of my season of fatherhood coming to an end, I'm finding that it's just now really beginning. And last but certainly not least, the reason I wanted to teach this morning was because I saw this incredible list of gifted guys that Pastor Neil has lined up for you this summer. And quite honestly, I didn't want to teach after any of them. <laughs> I mean, these guys are my heroes in the faith. Guys like Pastor Randy Pittman from Coastline Navarre. When I came on staff here at Coastline, Randy was this long-haired surfer kid who had just come back from Bible college. We grew up together in ministry here. Now he's pastoring, he's teaching, he's loving on a group of people just down the highway, and he's doing an amazing job with it. Uh, Pastor Ryan Burgess from the Gathering Church in Fort Walton is going to be here. You may not know Ryan, but Ryan actually served on staff with us here in Gulf Breeze and in Destin for a time. Then he did what he came here to do. He planted a church in Fort Walton, and he's teaching the Word there. His church is healthy, and it's growing. And then one of my favorites, Pastor Jess McKernan. Jess is the pastor of Coastline Destin. As if planning a church weren't hard enough, Pastor Jess went to Ireland. He planted a church in a post-Christian, non-practicing, but overtly Catholic nation. Who does that? I mean, really, there are a lot of easier places to plant churches. Jess has a huge heart, and you'll see that as he comes and shares with us in just a few weeks. So that's why I'm here on Father's Day, kind of hiding behind this huge pulpit. Our time in God's Word, as you would expect, has a big bullseye on fatherhood this morning. But please let me explain before the rest of you just completely tune me out. The message this morning is most certainly built on the foundation of what God's Word says to fathers about fathers. But here's the thing, 
Everything the Bible says about fatherhood is found in the context of three relationships that every father has. And in one way or another, you're included in those three relationships. So daddies, fathers, papas, whatever your kids call you, this message is definitely for you this morning. It's Father's Day. But as you'll see, the message also has application to each one of us through the family relationships that God has given us. So here's kind of the path that I'm leading you down for the next 30 minutes or so. Fathers, according to God's Word, you have three primary relationships in your life. These are the primary relationships and their priorities for life. There'll be preeminent relationships throughout your life. Did you see what I did there? The peas? Come on, guys. That was for Pastor Neil. I wanted to see what it felt like to be him for just a couple of seconds. It felt pretty good. Dads, these three relationships are primary. And they really are. That means that they're fundamental, are foundational, and they're significant to us. They're your priority relationships. They precede any other relationships that you have in terms of importance or urgency. And these relationships are preeminent. They are superior to, are notably above, all other relationships. And here's what that really means. They're the ones you need to invest in, that you need to endeavor to grow and build and be concerned about if they're not where they should be. And here they are. Your relationship with God, your relationship with your wife, and, of course, on Father's Day, your relationship with your children. And yes, they are in priority order. Your relationship with God is first. Next, your relationship with your wife. And only then, your relationship with your children. Why in that order? Well, because God said so. It's His order. Sincerely, these relationships should be approached in this order because it's in God's Word. So dads, we'll begin at the beginning. In Genesis 1, God said this, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We're made in the image of God. And here's the thing, God is relational. God is relational. Now, you hear that a lot in Christian circles, but what does it really mean that God is relational? It means that not only are we affected by God, but that He is affected by you and I. The Bible tells us that God feels compassion when we suffer. He feels pleasure when we're obedient to His commands. God is described to us as feeling the emotions of jealousy and anger. So when we say God is relational, what we're saying is that He engages in these giving and re receiving relationships with His creation. It's a two-way street. And because we're made in the image of relational God, we're relational. That's just the way we're made. We're made for relationship with Him. What's our part in that relationship? Well, it's described very distinctly for us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. We call it the greatest commandment. To the Hebrews, it was the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord our God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The Greater Westminster Catechism answered the question, what is the chief 
end of man, the highest end of man? And the answer was to glorify God and to fully enjoy Him forever. It's a relationship described over and over again in the New Testament with just two words, in Christ. In Christ. And fathers, here's what that means to you and I this morning. If we really want to be good fathers, and I'm kind of working under that premise this morning, we all want to do that. We first have to have a relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. We'll never experience fatherhood the way He designed it unless we have a relationship with the designer Himself. It's a thought summed up in a very familiar verse. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And the only way that you and I can experience a real relationship with an all-powerful, ever-present, all-loving, all-knowing God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said it this way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. According to Jesus, the Messiah and the Savior of all mankind, the only way we can come to the Father is in Christ. And this phrase, in Christ, is super important to what we're doing this morning. It's the most commonly used phrase in the Bible to describe a follower of Jesus. The expressions, in Christ, in the Lord, or in Him, occur 164 times in just the letters of Paul alone. English cleric and theologian John Scott gave this crystal clear definition. He said, to be in Christ does not mean to be inside of Christ as tools are in a box or clothes are in a closet but to be organically united to Christ as a limb is to the body or a branch is to the tree. It's this personal relationship with Christ that is the distinctive mark of His authentic followers. But listen, not only does it describe a relationship of unity with Christ, it's also a positional term. It links the follower with Christ, with Him, in the place of favor He has before God. Man, that's significant. So literally what it means, and trust me, you'll want to write this one down if you're a note taker, it means in Christ's place before God. In Christ means that we're both in unity with Christ And we're in the same place Jesus is before God. Now that should take our breath away. We're in that place, Jesus before God. Fathers, for you and I, this identifies with undeniable clarity both who we are, but also whose we are. In Christ, we belong to God. King David put it this way in the 100th Psalm. He said, acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. So what does it mean for you and I to be in Christ practically? Kind of on a day-to-day level. Well, I want you to take the next minute or so to listen to two short paragraphs that summarize our relationship with God in Christ. If you're a visual learner, they'll be up on the screen for you as well. It's a beautiful picture of who we are in Christ and what Jesus has done for each one of us. So let's listen together. You are a new creation in Christ. Through Christ, God has forgiven you. He has given you a new heart. 
He has placed his spirit in you. He has given you a new heart that knows how to follow him. He has made you acceptable forever. He has delivered you from the power of darkness and translated you into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus. He has given you his kingdom as an inheritance. He has hidden you in him with Christ. He has seated you with Christ in heavenly places. He has given you power to do what Jesus did. He works with you, confirming his word. He gives you wisdom and strength. He gives you the power to get wealth. He has made you great and precious promises so you would be a partaker of his divine nature. This is your new identity. This is the new you or the new man. In Christ, you've put on your new self, which is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And based on the authority of God's word, that's who you are and what you've been given in Christ. But here's the thing. You have to be connected to Jesus. You have to have a relationship with him for that to apply. You have to be in unity with him in order to have that position with him. And please listen, this is for everyone. Uh, Father's Day aside for just a moment. Here's the good news. This relationship with God in Christ this connection to Jesus and position with him, it's available to anyone and everyone right now, today. You don't have to wait for a special occasion. Your birthday, Christmas, Easter. You don't have to get all your ducks in a row to qualify, have everything figured out, or stop doing all the things you know you need to stop doing. In fact, if you don't have a relationship with God in Christ this morning, just by virtue of you being here in church, I would say that God's already reaching out to you. He is. Some of you know the old hymn that says, He's waiting and watching. And I believe that's what God does. He waits on us. He watches for us. Just like the prodigal son's father, God is waiting and watching for us to come home. He has a robe that he's ready to put around our shoulders. He has a ring that he's ready to place on your finger. And all you have to do is take one small step of faith, and he'll give you all the benefits my young friend Luca just read about and so many more. If you're not in a relationship, I want you to know this. God's not disappointed in you. He's not mad at you. He's looking squarely in your direction this morning. And he's very gently, very kindly saying, come home. So how do you do that? Well, here's the gospel in all its simplicity. First, you realize that God created us to be in fellowship with him. But there's a problem there. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, and it's proliferated through us. Our sin separates us from God. And because God is just, there's a price to be paid. It's the whole crime and punishment thing. It's justice in its purest form. And what's more, the price is too great for any of us to pay. There's nothing we can do, nothing we can offer to make ourselves right with God. Absolutely nothing. We're all alike in that we all need a Savior. But the good news is that Jesus has already done everything necessary to erase our sins and to bring us back into fellowship with God. He's done that. He suffered the wrath of God on the cross as our sins were placed upon him. And his blood is what ultimately satisfied the wrath of God and cleaned us up. On top of that, Jesus was raised to life again. He defeated sin and death. 
and he made it possible for us to have abundant life now and to live beyond the grave with him in the future in a place called heaven, the paradise of God. And the Bible promises that anyone who put their trust in Jesus alone will be saved. See, we can't earn it. We certainly don't deserve it. We just accept what Jesus did for us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul wrote it out for us like this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, period. End of discussion. Dads, others here today, if you don't know Jesus, regardless of the circumstances, the obstacles, the people, or the sin in your life, this can be the best day of your life. And all you have to do is say yes to him. It's easy. All right, back to Father's Day. Dads, the first relation of fatherhood in anyone's life really is a relationship with your heavenly father through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you really want to be a better father? Man, your next step couldn't be easier. You commit your life to Jesus. You leave your old life behind. You put on this new life in Jesus Christ, and you become the father that God made you to be. See, we have the power within us to change everything and begin a whole new life today just by saying yes to Jesus. And I want to ask you, if that's you today, just say yes in your heart right now. The Bible said God knows the thoughts and intentions of our heart. He'll understand what you're saying. And you can start your whole new life with him today in Christ Jesus. And some of you may be saying, but Joe, I've got that relationship. I'm living my life in Christ. I've surrendered my life to him. And I know many of you are in that relationship this morning. That's why you're here. You're investing in that. But I think God's word to you and I this morning is live like it. Man, live like you have that relationship. Get up every morning and read those two paragraphs that Luca read for us that summarize our relationship and our position in Christ. I got up and read those this morning. I needed that. And live like it. Get up the next day and do it again the next day and the next. Our communications team has printed out those two paragraphs that describe our life in Christ for you, specifically for dads this morning. And dads, it's in the bag that you should have received when you came in. If you didn't get a bag, get one on the way out. If you're here this morning and you're not a father, you'd like to have that card, we've got some available for you at the information center out in the foyer. If you're watching online, email us. We'll get that information to you. Remind yourself often of who you are and all that Jesus has done for you. Next, fix your mind on Jesus. Discover that perfect peace that Pastor John was talking about by reading God's Word every day. Daily in the Word, our daily devotions, is a great way, an easy way to do that. One of the best things I've ever done in my devotional life personally, I stole from Oswald Chambers, morning and evening. <laughs> I heard somebody say that. I, I read God's Word in the morning because it gets me ready for what God has planned for my life. And it also reminds me that there's an enemy out there that's going to put obstacles in my path. Again, in the evening, I read his word to kind of cleanse my mind from all the garbage that I picked up during the day. And that brings me back to an attitude of thanksgiving and praise 
for what God has already done for me. Try it. See what it does for you. I, I picked this up from another daily devotional. It's just a quick paragraph. You can tell I've carried it around my briefcase for a while. Most people don't set out to sabotage their future. Yet it can happen anyway because of their own ignorance, rebellion, or blatant disregard for God and His Word. The course of one man's entire life can be derailed by foolish errors in judgment, and future consequences can be disastrous. As Christians, we have God's Word and His Spirit to guard and guide us, but that doesn't make us immune to poor choices, especially in times of weakness. We're more likely to make unwise decisions when we're extremely hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Impatience and strong desires can also lead us astray and blind us to potential consequences. That's why we must learn to make decisions by using long-term perspectives based on God's Word instead of focusing on what's immediately in front of us. Fix your mind. Use God's Word to do that. Fathers, invest in godly relationships with other men so they'll be there when you need them. Find three, four, or five guys that you can share life with. Pour into them and let them pour into you. Also in the bag you received when you came in, guys, there's this man card that Pastor Neil mentioned. Man, we got a, a, a great retreat planned in late October, and we're telling you about it now so you can go ahead and take off. Reserve those dates for that men's retreat. You got plenty of time to do it. Be there. Connect with other guys that are like-minded. We need godly men in our lives. Our tendency, my tendency, is to drift if I don't have that covering. I send a few guys some spiritual thoughts and encouragement through text messages every week. And they think I'm doing it for them. <laughs> I'm doing it for me. I need those kind of relationships in my life. Give some godly men permission to ask the hard questions and to hold you accountable. Be honest about your struggles. James said this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I think James knew that we needed to get rid of the garbage to experience God's healing power in our lives. And let me encourage you, be involved in the local church. Coastline is not a perfect church because John Spencer is here. <laughs> he said that. I'm just repeating what he said. Sincerely, Coastline's not a perfect church. That, that comes under the heading of things you say on your last day at Coastline. <laughs> Coastline's not a perfect church, but it's a good church. It's a Bible teaching church. It's a gospel proclaiming church. And the Bible is clear. You can't say yes to Jesus and no to church. It just doesn't work that way. The church belongs to Jesus. He created it. The church is described in Scripture as the bride of Christ. He gave his life for her. Man, don't ever talk bad about the church, about the king's daughter. Father, you need to be engaged in the life of the local church. I need to be engaged in the life of the local church. And Christian men, we need to be an example and help those who are struggling. I mean, we all struggle at times. I think it was John Corson who said, you're either plowing or you're proclaiming. You're either down in the furrow plowing just as hard and as fast as you can to get out, or you're proclaiming that you made it through that one and you're kind of waiting for the next one. 
And listen, in that illustration, we're not the plower. We're the plow. I mean, Jesus is the one in control. He's the plower. He's the one that's steering us. We're creating the furrow. And the only thing we can see is dirt. I mean, we've got solid ground ahead of us. We've got big piles on each side of us that we've just been through. And the only thing that keeps us in line is Jesus. And don't forget this. You're God's instrument for sharing the good news. You've got it. Others need it. You need to share it. And one last thing and we'll move on. From 1 Kings chapter 8. And may you be completely faithful to the Lord our God. May you always obey His decrees and commands just as you are doing today. Dads, if you're living a life in Christ, keep doing it. Don't quit. Don't even think about quitting. There's way too much at stake. I know some of you are here this morning, and you look real good on the outside but you're kind of teetering on the edge on the inside. That happens to all of us. I've been there. It's tough, I get it. But you don't have to go through the trial alone. You don't, you're not meant to. One of the things I repeated over and over again to my son was to admit when you're wrong, ask for forgiveness, and do everything you can to make it right. Because then I can walk with you through the consequences. Otherwise, you gotta do it alone. See, even if he was completely wrong in what he did, he didn't have to go through it alone. And I'm here to tell you this morning, God will do the same for you. I stole that from him. God will be there for you. Now, I feel like we should be pretty close to done, but we're not. So fathers, the second relationship in your life, second only to God, is your relationship with your wife. The wisest man who ever lived said this about a man's relationship with his wife. He said, you can be right, you can be happy, but you can't be both. Actually, Pastor John said that. I stole it from him. And he's a very wise man. But listen to the words of King Solomon. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Fathers, choose to be joyful in your relationship with your wife. Not only for your health and your well-being, but your kids, they need to see that. Doesn't matter what age they are. Biblically, the relationship is built on love. Not puppy love, not brotherly love, but the kind of love that God demonstrated to us through Jesus Christ. Guys, every one of us should have Ephesians 5.25 underscored, highlighted, otherwise emphasized in our Bibles. This is where it all starts. Paul said this, for husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. And here's the thing, Paul is instructing us to do something that we really can't do. It's impossible for us. We don't possess that kind of love in our flesh. It's only by God's Spirit, through our relationship with Him in Christ, that we can love our wives as Jesus loved the church. Now, that may have turned on a light bulb for a few of you. And you're right, that's the one reason that your relationship with the Lord comes before your relationship with your wife and before other relationships because, see, the standards for every other relationship in our life 
Man, they're impossible to obtain without His power. And His power is only available to us through His Spirit. Now, we need to move quickly, but Neil told you we'd be in 1 Peter chapter 3. This is, this is the time. Uh, if you're there, say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. All right, great. 1 Peter chapter 3, and just one verse, verse 7. It's amazing how much is packed into this verse. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. Men, Father, God's standard for you and I in living with our wives is to honor them. My wife, your wife, is not a business partner. She's not an employee. She's certainly not a servant, but someone who should be honored and cherished through our relationships and in our homes. There's a reel going around on social media, you may have seen it, about a wife questioning her husband. Why did you park here? Have you seen that one? I sent it to Anna because that's one of my buttons that she frequently pushes. <laughs> she didn't reply. <laughs> Anna was brought up in a family where it was okay, maybe even encouraged to ask questions. I mean, that's the way that we learn. We ask questions. But see, in my family, asking questions was kind of challenging authority. It was looked at very differently. So in situations where Anna asks a question that I think is challenging my authority as her husband, I just don't answer. <laughs> Trust me, it never goes well. <laughs> but God has used that and continues to use that to grow me. It's been said that God will change your heart if you will change your mind, and I believe that's true. I had to change my mind about Anna and others just asking me questions. And when I do that, God changes my heart so that I respond very differently according to His will. Then I can honor my wife in spite of my buttons being pushed. I can do that. I often describe Anna's personality like a party in a can. There's no controlling it. It can pop open at any time. <laughs> and the problem with that is sometimes it's at the worst possible time for me. And it's all about me, right? I mean, her personality is one of the greatest gifts God has given her. One of the things I cherish the most about my wife. You can ask anyone that knows us. I'm just no fun without Anna. We don't get party invitations for just me. <laughs> Doesn't happen. But sometimes it's that wonderful, bubbly personality that challenges me in honoring her as my wife. But if I ask God to help me see my wife from his perspective, all is right in the world. Things go better. And praise God, we've been partying together now for 32 years. It's a great thing. Fathers, we're also encouraged to treat our wives with understanding. Understanding means knowing your wife well enough to demonstrate love to her, even when those challenges arise. And they do arise. I remember not too long ago coming home after a long day's work to find five kittens in my guest bathroom. Five. Someone had made a, a cozy new home for them by putting fresh, soft blankets in the bathtub. And they're just happy. I was not. <laughs> Among other things, Anna's a pet magnet. 
animals I absolutely love her. So knowing her disposition toward animals, I had to live with her in understanding for a few days while she found homes for those five kittens. And she did. Then she paid to have the stray mom fixed. Still don't understand that, why that happened. Pastor Neil was sharing about the summer at Coastline Series last week when he said he was looking forward to seeing the special messages God has been working in and through each of the speakers. And that's not something to laugh about because God does. I've had to work through this message. The speakers that are coming up, they have to work through that in their own personal lives. Last week, I came home to a note on the door. I kid you not, the note's up there, please remove your shoes. Thank you. Later, I found another just in case I came in through the garage. <laughs> now, I'm okay on the outside, but my, my head is twitching a little bit on the inside. I mean, I'm the head of the household. And Anna would agree with that wholeheartedly, yet there's a new rule in the house, and I'm the last to know. <laughs> but being the wonderful father and husband that I am, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I didn't handle the new rule well. But after a couple of tense days, with God consistently reminding me that I'm to live in understanding with my wife, I submitted to his will. I started taking my shoes off at the door. When I do premarital counseling, I often tell couples, to have a good marriage, someone has to die to themselves. See, I should be happy that my wife cares so much about cleanliness in our home. And I do now. But first, I had to die to myself. Peter said, honor your wife. Live with her in understanding. And then he said, your wife is an equal partner in God's gift of new life. An equal partner. We're equals before God. And here's the thing. She's not just your wife. She's a sister who shares that in Christ relationship that we talked about. She's also the daughter of a king, the king. And she's a princess in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you want to treat your wife right, meditate on that for a bit. On the other hand, if you want to experience a father's wrath, mess with his daughter. Yeah, you got those two options. And if that weren't enough, God, through his spirit, gives us motivation through consequences. Peter said, treat her as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. Gentlemen, you want to be a good and godly father? Follow Peter's advice about your relationship with your wife. Live with her in an understanding way, loving and honoring her as God's gift to you. That's what she is. She's also a co-heir with you in the kingdom of heaven. She's the daughter of the king. And I don't know about you, but I need God to hear my prayers. I need him to respond to them. And so much more as I see the day approaching. We've run out of time, and I'm okay with that. And you may be thinking, but Joe, it's Father's Day. You, you forgot about the kids, and they're the most important part. To that, I would say, not really. What I've been trying to communicate this morning, what I hope you heard, is that successful fatherhood is about prioritizing your relationships and doing them according to the order that God has set in place. Real quick, here's my perspective on kids, because I do have one. They come and they go. And some of you know this. Sometimes they come and they go again and again and again. 
But ultimately, guys, it's going to be you and the wife that God gave you. And there's a very real temptation out there to be child-centered because they're easy. I've been there. When Ian was a kid, I knew how to please him 100% of the time. I didn't have a clue what to do with Anna. But if you take the bait that the enemy lays out there for you, you'll wake up one day and your kids will be gone and you still won't have a clue what to do with your wife. She's always going to be there with you. Our nest is now empty. And please don't misunderstand me. Anna and I still love each other. I thank God for that. We're no less committed to each other than when we started this thing 32 years ago. But it's a new season in life. It's, it's a different season in life. And only because God is sovereign and only because he's at the center of our relationship, we're convinced that the best is yet to come. I really do believe that. Fathers, your relationship with God is first. It's preeminent. It's above all others. Then comes your relationship with your wife. The bride that God has given you is your second relational priority. And listen, this is the absolute truth. I've never met a father who's got those two relationships right from a godly perspective who failed in his relationship with his kids. Dads, God will take care of your kids if you'll steward the relationships according to his plan. Let's pray. And then I'm going to go buy Anna some flowers.